I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And my name is Gay Strathen. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, the Book of Ezekiel. And we are so excited to welcome Gay Strathern back for a second time this year to join us. Uh, she's going to help us put the easy back in Ezekiel, so we're excited <laughs> with her expertise here. We'll see. So before we dive into the text, we're going to put on the board a brief overview outline of the book of Ezekiel, as well as a map of the Middle East, and this, we hope, will give us all a larger perspective of what's going on as we read Ezekiel's words. So we have this perfect geographical representation of the Middle East, and uh, this lovely handwriting, I'm not sure who did it, but so we have three core uh, chunks in the book of Ezekiel. So the first 11 chapters are accusations against Israel, then there's judgment, and then there's hope. And just for context again, remember there's several core covenants that animate the scriptures. God made these eternal promises to Abraham and his posterity. He brought the people to Mount Sinai and, uh, and then asked them to be loyal to him by revealing the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses. And they had all these generations where they could practice loyalty and covenantal faithfulness. And what we see is Ezekiel spends quite a bit of time in that covenantal context using interesting symbols to talk about how the people consistently failed to be covenantally loyal and faithful to God. And that's one of the things we can take in our day is how can we learn from the people in the past? How can we learn when they did things right? How can we learn from what they did that was wrong and hopefully repeat the good and not repeat the bad? Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit of the background of the history now in Ezekiel. Um, so some of this history is already set up in, uh, in the discussion of Jeremiah. Jeremiah and Ezekiel are rough contemporaries. Ezekiel's probably a little bit younger than Jeremiah, but it's setting up in the context uh, with the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel are both in the context of the Neo-Babylonian armies coming and uh, taking control of Judea. So uh, one of the things that is specific for uh, Ezekiel, if we open to chapter 1, um, verses 1 through 3, it's the introduction. Now, it came to pass in the 30th year and in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar, that the heavens opened and I saw the visions of God. And in the fifth day of the month, which is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came unto Ezekiel. So what do we know about Jehoiachin? Jehoiachin is the son of Jehoiakim, which you would have heard about in terms of Jeremiah. Um, and he is the one that when the Babylonians come and they're going to lay siege to Jerusalem in about 597, 598. He's going to be the king, and he's going to be taken away with a, a some of the upper class uh, peoples, and they're going to be taken to, to Babylon. And so it's during his um, the fifth year of his reign and of his time in captivity that Ezekiel is going to uh, start having his experiences, and that he's going to be talking about in this book. All right, so if we're looking here in terms of uh, the Levant, they're in Jerusalem. This is where Jehoiakim Chin is reigning. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, is going to come down through a series of battles here, and it's going to come to a point here where they're going to lay siege uh, to Jerusalem, and that's the beginning of the book of, um, of Ezekiel. One of the things I think with this... Uh, uh, outline here to understand is that chapters 1 through 32 are all happening pre-Jerusalem's destruction by the Babylonians, and then 33 and down is talking about roughly the 16 years that are after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. When we talk about the fall of Jerusalem, it can be a little confusing because we think it's just a single event, and it turns out it's a process over time. So Ezekiel is among the first captives around 597, 598, where the Babylonians are not appreciating the rebelliousness of Jerusalem. They want the people here paying their tribute and taxes to Babylon, and the people here don't like paying money to foreign rulers. 
So the Babylonians come in and they depopulate a portion of Jerusalem with you know, like the upper class, the pr many priests, the king. But they put on a, the throne a puppet king and they continue to rebel. And so that's when Babylon comes in and says, okay, we're just done with you guys and we are going to destroy the city, which has the temple, and the palace, and the homes of all the rich. Like these are all the foundations for people's source of wanting to rebel. So when we talk about the fall of Jerusalem, we're really talking about 587, 586, even though 10 years before, and even a little earlier, Babylon has already been impacting and depopulating Jerusalem. So it's, it's, it's a process over time. So although this history overlaps between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, the major difference is that Jeremiah is a prophet at, in Judea, and he's there experiencing all of these things that are going on. Ezekiel, however, is called to be a prophet to the captives who are already in Babylon. And so um, he's warning them about what's going to happen in Jerusalem, uh, even though it hadn't happened uh, as the book opens. So just for those of you who, who are more familiar with the Book of Mormon, this is, this is absolutely a critical uh, history point because keep in mind, Lehi is preaching in Jerusalem during the first year of the reign of King Zedekiah. So Nephi, Lehi, Laman, Lemuel, Sam, they know this, the, this history very well. They are living it and they're about to leave probably uh, either shortly after or right around the same time that Ezekiel was carried away to the north, they're going to head to the south and you get this, this split just so we, we see this cross, uh, cross section over to and the Book so of Mormon. We, we also can see that Zedekiah is Jehoiachin's uncle, right? So um, that's the relationship between them. Yeah, and again, he's a, he's a puppet ruler. He, he's put there by the Babylonians to say, you are going to be loyal to us, and it turns out he then uh, tried to, to make an alliance with Egypt, and that didn't, that didn't go so well for him. It's also kind of interesting, the Babylonian records that we have indicate they saw Jehoiachin as the legitimate king. All the way till 569 BC on Babylonian records, Jehoiachin and his family are, are taken care of by the Babylonian king. They eat at his table. And even Ezekiel talks about Zedekiah as kind of a regent prince, never really calls him the king. And so it's fascinating to see these different perspectives. So you have Jeremiah as a prophet in Jerusalem, Ezekiel as a prophet in Babylon. You have Lehi and Nephi who are prophets in the south, but now heading over to the new world. So it's fascinating that we get these three different perspectives of this massive pivotal event in Israelite history. Ezekiel, the name in a means something as it normally does in the ancient world. So Ezekiel comes from two Hebrew words, chazak meaning strong and el meaning God. So the name itself means something like God strengthens or God is strong or something along those lines. I think that's important because names in the ancient world mean important things. And so even seeing Ezekiel and hearing his name, there's something being taught to the people. Um, what we know about in Ezekiel chapter 1 about Ezekiel is that Ezekiel is a priest. Um, so he's from the Aaronic lineage. And uh, one of the things that I think that's really important is because if you read Ezekiel, it's, it's a kind of a different type of text than, say, Jeremiah, um, because Ezekiel is much more a priestly text. It's, it's viewing things through the lens of being a priest. And so that's one of the reasons we get some really, really important fundamental stuff about Ezekiel and the temple that I think it's important for us to talk about today. So here's the, here's the funny thing about his story is if he had stayed in Jerusalem, when he turns 30, he would be fully ready to go as a priest in the temple performing all these priestly functions, which is, like Gay said, Isaiah wasn't a priest, Jeremiah wasn't a priest, so this is this is unique, and yet he has been taken out of Jerusalem. He has no chance to perform those priestly functions, and here we are at this river on his 30th birthday, and he's probably feeling pretty discouraged about that my life is not turning out the way that I had anticipated. And by the way, there are probably many of you watching who could say, you know, I relate with Ezekiel. 
because maybe you've faced some serious discouragement or letdown or unfulfilled dreams or shattered hopes and and saying is there <laughs> is there anything worth worth living for at this point moving forward i I've, I've lost i've lost my dream that's kind of where ezekiel is when this vision is going to unfold for him and briefly how does it end it ends on hope so sure there's been difficulties that israel Israel has to experience, Ezekiel's people experience, he, even he's experiencing this, but eventually it's hope, and for all of us, this is what Jesus brings. So I love how the book concludes on this really hopeful chapter that God will bring his, Eden, his paradise and his Eden again to all of us. And that's why I think it's really important that we read the whole book of Ezekiel and not just pick and choose some chapters of it because we don't, you might just read the judgment parts and think, oh, this is a horrible book, but, but you've got to see it in the context of the flow. And so the book starts with this kind of this really interesting vision that um, uh, Ezekiel receives. It's probably not one that, that is uh, familiar to us. It's full of symbolism. Um, and so we, I, I think it's important that we take some time kind of trying to unpack this a little bit because it really is going to introduce things that are going to pop up again later on in the book as we go. So as you look through uh, chapter one, by my count at least, uh, th th there's 14 times in one chapter where it's referring to the likeness. What, what Ezekiel is seeing is like something or the likeness of it. And I think that that's to reinforce for us um, the symbolic nature of what's going what's going on here. Now, I think uh, as we see these these uh, living creatures that are so very very different from the realm that we're familiar with, um, they, there's some symbolism here that is not just unique to Ezekiel. Some of it we're going to see in Isaiah's prophetic call. We're going to see some of the imagery in Daniel, and and the Book of Revelation picks up a lot of this this imagery as we as um, we go through. So let's talk a little bit about what he's, uh, Ezekiel is seeing. He's seeing some beings that are strange to us. So what are these suggesting to us? Um, number one, I think if we're looking at symbols here of these four faces is reflective of divine attributes or qualities. So the human face is the, uh, may, we may read that to represent intelligence. Uh, remember that it was only humans that were created in the image of God, and they were different from God's other creations. Of course, the lion uh, often has the symbol of royalty. Um, the ox is kind of probably one of the foremost of the domesticated animals, and so has this uh, symbolism of strength. And then the eagle, the chief of the birds, is uh, uh, the symbol of mobility. And so the creature here is trying to tell us about the attributes of God. Uh, Ezekiel is going to call these, uh, these living creatures later in chapter 10, the cherubim. Um, and I think it's important for us to know something a little bit about uh, the cherubim. Cherubim are divine beings. Uh, they're composite beings that are going to combine the features of certain animals with humans, uh, but they're also uh, associated very much with the Ark of the Covenant in the temple, so that the cherubim are going to sit atop uh, the mercy seat um, where God sits in judgment upon his people. And I think that that's a really, really important image that we've just talked about a little bit here. This first part of Ezekiel is going to be very much a judgment scene but the, 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 the imagery of cherubim helps us see that uh, even in his judgment, God is going to couch that judgment within his mercy. So I think that that's an important issue. So let's pick this up in chapter one. Um, uh, we've also, oh, they've got wheels, right? That's another image. And I think that that is just this ability that these beings don't move like we do. Uh, they're not linear. They have the ability to go whichever way. Um, and so making a difference between us and, and them. Yeah, can you imagine Ezekiel, this man who lives in this ancient time period, probably did not have access to a massive dictionary vocabulary. And he's seeing this like incredible experience of God. Like, how do you express it? 
we all have the benefit that we've grown up with these texts and we have a general sense of what's going on. But I just, my heart goes out to Ezekiel who on his 30th birthday, he's like, I'm not in Jerusalem. I want, I want to be a priest. And he sees this incredible priestly vision of the temple of God and all these amazing things. And he's like, how do I express this to people yes. in a way that conveys God's divine message? So can, can I just really quickly draw, I, I'm a terrible artist, but the idea being that at the four corners of this chariot, you have these four headed, this is terrible, with wings. I don't know why I'm even trying this. They have the wings. You have a set of these cherubim at all of the four corners holding this platform and on top of the platform, here's the, the, the throne of God. So ignore the drawing here, just picture four sets of these four-headed and four-winged uh, cherubim carrying the throne of God, and like Gay said, they're not, they're, they don't have legs. They've got wheels within wheels, and they can go any direction they want whenever they want. And they can see in all four cardinal directions. I want to tie us into something we're all familiar with. The month of January is based on the Roman god Janus. It's a two-faced god who looks back and looks forward. And if you think about what happens in January, we look back on the past year and we celebrate the last year, and we look forward in anticipation to the new year. But it's, you know, just two faces, forward and backwards. Here, you have four faces looking in all directions, symbolizing God's ability to see everything in his created order. So let's pick this up now in the, the last section of chapter 1. And above the firmament that was over the heads was, notice again this language, the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And so oftentimes they're describing God as the likeness of something, just because, again, how do you, how do you describe um, um, God? And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about it, from the appearance um, of his loins even upwards, and from the appearance of his loins even downwards. I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. Now, this, this imagery here, again, is really, really important. Um, I want to actually jump back for a moment. I should have done this earlier to verse 4. As this vision opens, uh, Ezekiel says, And I looked and beheld a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire enfolding it. And the brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So I want us to kind of think through these these things that, that Ezekiel is seeing, whirlwind. The Hebrew word here is ruach. That ruach is a really, really rich word. Um, it can mean lots of different things. Um, and it can mean uh, a breath. It can mean spirit with a little s. It can mean spirit with a big s. And it can mean wind. So it's a very, very rich word. But it symbolizes this idea of that, that Ezekiel is seeing spirit, and cloud and fire. And these are representative of the divine presence, the Shekinah, right? Um, because it's the visible presence of God because humans don't normally see God, but they see this visible representation. You can think about this with uh, the Exodus and they're coming out and they're led by, by God, but what are they seeing? A fire by night, a fire, pillar of fire and a cloud. So these are representations, again, of the glory of God. So when we come over here and we're talking about this idea of seeing God and fire, um, I, think, I, I think about the prophet Joseph when he says that God dwells in everlasting burnings. Um, so what's the imagery of, of that? Fire can be both destructive, but it also can be a cleansing fire. So this fire is the sense of that mortals, if they're coming into the presence of God, can be destroyed, can be consumed by the fire, um, unless God does something for them. Um, we talk about that as in terms of a transfiguration of some kind mm. to enable mere humans to enter the presence of God. But then notice verse 28, and the appearance of the bow that was in the cloud in the day of rain. So we also get this imagery of God on his throne sitting in judgment, but like in Revelation chapter 4, 
that image is is kind of surrounded by this rainbow. And as we know from um, the story of Noah in particular, the rainbow was a symbol for God. And, and the symbol that it represents is God's mercy. And so I want to reiterate that. We've got these cherubim here. We've got uh, the rainbow here. All of these are reinforcing. God, God wants Ezekiel to know before he goes into the judgments, he wants him to know absolutely clearly this important aspect of mercy in any judgments that God does. This is so very helpful because so often what happens with the Bible writers is that they occupy their cultural space. They know exactly what they are thinking and experiencing. And sometimes they don't, they leave things out. They don't explain all this background. And so we jump in, we're like, this is a bizarre vision. What does it mean? And we try to, we struggle to make sense of it in our own lives. So this context is super helpful to realize that God is conveying a message of ultimate mercy and hope. And it's couched in all these symbols that God is this purifying presence of fire that he will purify us and bring us into his presence. Which, by the way, <clears throat> if you put it into Ezekiel's context, in exile, out in Babylon, in, in this time period, about five years after they've been carried away from Jerusalem, he's a priest, it's his 30th birthday, it's all rooted in the temple, and here he's seeing the presence of God in Babylon. In their day, the presence of God should be in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, back in Jerusalem, at the mercy seat, which, by the way, don't you love that, that we call it the mercy seat and not the justice seat? I know he's got lots of justice and judgment, but I love the fact that they, they call it the mercy seat, and, and you've set this up beautifully to, to bookend the book of Ezekiel with mercy and mercy with a whole bunch of judgment in, in that middle portion. So here's Ezekiel probably scratching his head saying, wait a minute, what is going on? Why is God's presence out here and not in the Holy of Holies? That's where it belongs. People should be coming to the temple. wonder if something's going really, really wrong back in Jerusalem. And he's going to pick yeah. that up later in the chat in, in, in his book. That's going to be a yeah. really, really important image that he wants to talk about. In fact, that one question may be driving a big portion of this text. Yeah. I didn't put this up here, but I probably should have. The big question is, why is God's presence in Babylon? Why has it gone into exile? And then God reveals a reason, that the people have rejected God again and again and again. Therefore, he has to judge them by withdrawing his presence from them. Now, I want you to think about sacrament. When we go to the sacrament, we promise to remember God and to do his, his will. And if we do, we have his presence. And if we choose to purposely and consistently and intentionally and persistently deny God and be away from God, we will lose his presence and we will experience these things. But God says, look, you can always remember me and come back in. So this is really driving this entire 48 chapters. Why is God's presence no longer in his Holy of Holies? In fact, actually, why is the Holy of Holies come out into Babylon? It's because God is judging the people, but eventually his enduring promises made to Abraham will give the opportunity for all people to be blessed, Israel, the nations, and all of creation. So we've given you a bit of a preview of what's going on throughout this whole chapters, but we, we perhaps got ahead of ourselves a bit because it's exciting stuff. Let's go back into his call as a prophet and then see how that leads to this experience of seeing God's presence moving with his people into Babylon. So chapter two and three represents um, his, his prophetic call. So we know he's a priest, but now we're getting a prophetic call. And, and it's, it, the contrast here, I think, is very important between chapter one, all of these divine um, uh, things that, that he is seeing, and then chapter two opens up and, and uh, an, an angel is talking to him, and he said unto me, son of man. Son of man is uh, a really, really important phrase in the scriptures, not just here in Ezekiel, but it's mentioned 94 times here in Ezekiel. And, and there are lots of ways that, um, or a number of ways that the phrase son of man is used in the scriptures. So I think it's really important that we, we tease out what they are. So for a start, um, son of man can be a, in, in Aramaic, can be a reference to self, right? So for example, Jesus says, 
Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. All he's saying is foxes and birds have homes, but I don't, right? So there's there's that aspect of it. Um, we also have it in Daniel, where son of man is going to refer to an end time, an eschatological messianic figure that is going to come. So that's a different way of looking at it. Um, in Latter-day Saint scripture in Moses, son of man is a reference definitely to Jesus Christ. Um, but here it is a reference to, to Ezekiel saying, you're different from these divine beings. You ain't them, right? But I'm still going to use you as a human they're emphasizing his humanity, but God can still use a human to do his work here on earth. And so we have this call going out to him. That's beautiful. Chapter three is a continuation then of this call where Ezekiel is being invited. Well, his call is to be a watchman to the house of Israel. Uh, that watchman, again, is a really important symbolism that comes up, isn't it? Um, I think uh, the place where that really came to my mind was when I was in Israel and I went to an ancient city named Chatzor, which is in the northern Galilee. And this was a really, really major city in during Old Testament times. And uh, there is a watchtower there um, that you can go in and see and experience, right? Um, and so it gave me this idea of um, ancient people didn't live, for the most part, within walled cities. They lived out in the surrounding areas where they had fields um, and they, they um, grew crops and things like that. But the watchman was this person who stood on this tower and looked out to see if there is any kind of armies coming. And Hatsur is right on this major thoroughfare that Nebuchadnezzar would have come through probably. And there's a kind of a place here, there's kind of a valley between two mountains where you can't see anything, and then there's a turn, and then it comes right past Hatsor. So for a watchman being there, his responsibility, as soon as those armies uh, were seen by him, that he was to blow his shofar or his trumpet so that all of the people in the surrounding fields could know that something important is happening and they could leave their fields and could come into the protection of the city. So Ezekiel here is going to learn as a spiritual watchman, his responsibility is to sound the alarm when there is danger, spiritual danger. And if he sounds the alarm and people ignore them, then that's their responsibility. But if he fails to sound the alarm, then all of those people who die will be, um, he will be responsible for their deaths. And so the Lord is sending this up here and he's kind of saying, Ezekiel, you have something important here. And I think what he's also saying is that God is saying with this call, uh, this is going to be a difficult call to be a prophet. It's not going to be difficult in the sense of you're talking to people who don't speak your language. But it's going to be difficult because people don't want to listen to you. And so I, and they, they're going to say nasty things to you. He says to me constantly, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. But also don't be rebellious like them and not um, do what I'm asking you to do because of fear of what they might do to you. So this, this imagery becomes really important. And you can see all of that in verses 15 through 20. If you read those Gay has beautifully encapsulated what the Lord's telling him in those verses there. And it's going to be picked up again later on in yeah. chapter 33 as well. So between chapters 4 through 7, you get Ezekiel starting his, his watchman job, which is to warn the people, but he does it in some really bizarre ways. If you read chapter 4 and 5, you're going to see him using some, some acting and some symbols to, to get people's attention, for them to say, what are you doing? And he then teaches them through those symbols about what he sees coming their way and the destructions. This is his way of warning them. It's like street theater. Yeah. You can verbalize things or you can pantomime it. I mean, things like he lays on his side for a year and cooks his food over dung, saying, you guys are all going to be experiencing something like this because of your rejection of God. 
which now brings us into his vision of the Jews back in Jerusalem in chapter 8. Okay. So let's look up in chapter 8, and uh, verse 3 tells us that God is actually going to take Ezekiel in a vision back to Jerusalem. Um, Verse 4, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, uh, just like it was in chapter 1. Verse 6, and he saith furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? These are the people of Jerusalem. Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. So again, what is it that the Jews are doing that is causing God to to leave his sanctuary? And the, 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 the big answer is it's their idolatry. This is something from the time of judges they were warned about about the gods of the land and don't worship them uh, because of the covenant, but they're going to do it. So look at verses 12 through 16 with me. This is one of those verses that we, we can't just read. We've got to feel because this is God's response and how he's feeling about what's happening. Verse 12, then said he unto me, son of man, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark when every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. God has left us. So what do we do? And God's not going to see what we do. We can do it in secret. But the answer is God does see and it pains him. And he said unto me, turn thee yet again and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, an Amorite god. Then said he unto them, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Can you feel what God must have been feeling here? All that he has done for Israel, all of the prophets that he sent, all of the ways that the covenant he has sent with them, But the people in Israel are turning their backs on him, and they have chosen other gods besides him. So the temple now was becoming this place for the worship of other gods. So so look what happens now. Let's go over to chapter 10, um, where we have verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubs, So the cherub, so again, we're thinking here, holy of holies, where the cherub beam are on the the Ark of the Covenant in the holy of holies, which is the place that is made most holy by the presence of God. So the glory of the Lord is rising up. It's leaving the holy of holies. And it stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of God's God's glory. Now over to verses 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. Um, And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's temple. And the glory of God of Israel was over them. So it's rising up as it leaves the temple. Uh, Verse 16 of chapter 11. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them afar off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among all of the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Um, And then lastly, verses 22 through 25. Oh, 22 and 23 will do. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of God of Israel was over them above. 
And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the story of the city. So the, the, the Shekinah, the glory of God, is leaving the Holy of Holies. It's up there and then it's moving towards the east. Um, with the symbol here that, as we've talked about, that God has not abandoned his people. There are consequences when people break their covenants, but God will not abandon them even then. And he will move with them to Babylon to help his people and to protect his people and to try and uh, maintain that covenantal relationship with him. I think that that's a really, really beautiful concept that, that if we miss these chapters in Ezekiel, we miss, miss something fundamental about what this book is trying to teach us. This is really helpful to talk about God's presence, the Shekinah. Remember, God's presence can be with you at all times. When you were baptized, you then received the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is a promise of God's presence always being with you if you choose to remember him and the covenants you've made. Sacrament is an opportunity every week to renew your commitment to God and have his presence to go with you. Now, as we move on through Ezekiel, we'll get to chapter 33. We're, we've seen a lot of judgment in the Old Testament. We think you guys get the message. Well, hopefully, we all get the message. So there's all this judgment, and then we come down to chapter 33. We're in verse 21. Ezekiel hears from a messenger who's escaped Jerusalem that the city now has finally fallen and has been destroyed. If you turn to the Book of Mormon, we also have a similar message where Nephi and Lehi get a revelation for their family that Jerusalem has been destroyed. So the culmination of the judgment is Jerusalem is now scattered, the people are scattered, the walls have been knocked down, the temple has been burned, and God's presence has now fled and is now in Babylon. And this leads us, as we leave chapter 33, we then move into all these chapters of hope, 34 to 38. First, there's hope for Israel. Next, there's hope for all the nations. God cares about all his children. And then there's hope for his created order. And what we have here is that just like back in creation, God created everything and pronounced it good. We have a reenactment in some ways of creation and a Garden of Eden situation where God once again brings goodness to the world, not just for Israel, not just for all people, but for the entire created order. That is how this book concludes. So if we look at chapter 34, right after the, the falling of Jerusalem, you'll notice Ezekiel picks up this theme of shepherds, this symbol of the shepherds. Look at verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? So you see this, it's back to what he was talking about with, with a watchman on the tower. The, the reason there's a watchman on the tower isn't to protect the watchman. It's to protect the people that can't see what the watchman can see. The reason for a shepherd isn't for the flock to be a buffer to protect the shepherd from danger. It's for the shepherd who can see things, who's intelligent, who knows things that the flock doesn't know to protect the flock and to make sure that they get fed and protected appropriately and the shepherds in Jerusalem have been feeding themselves off of the flock, not taking care of the flock. When you get into the New Testament in John chapter 10, Jesus is going to pick up this, this narrative again of shepherds, referring to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees and some of the, the chief priests of the people, those who should be the shepherds of the flock, those who should be nurturing that flock and caring for them, who are actually glutting themselves off of the flock instead, ties us back directly here into Ezekiel 34. Notice verse 10, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hands and cause them to cease from feeding the flocks, neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. There's this sense of accountability that God is going to hold you accountable one day for what you did. Um, now, lest it stay all in the negative side, notice how Ezekiel then shifts it to the hope side. 
again, are you noticing this pattern between judgment and hope? We got that in in Isaiah chapters 1 through 39, and then hope 40 through 66. But in 1 through 39, you had little micro sections where you would get a whole bunch of judgment with some hope. So there's this pattern that repeats itself at big levels in books in the Old Testament and in small levels within a single chapter or a, a small group of chapters at times. And that's what we're getting here in this chapter is some judgment at the beginning of chapter 34 followed by some hope. So he's painted the, the picture of what a bad shepherd is, now he's going to describe what a good shepherd is. Verse 11, for thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Jesus is going to model this through his entire ministry, and, and at one point in Luke 15 you get that group of, of scribes and Pharisees who come and look at Jesus eating with publicans and sinners, table fellowship with known dirty people, right, in their mind, and Jesus says, I have some stories to tell you, and the very first story he tells, the first parable, is the parable of the lost sheep. I seek out them that are lost, right? Verse 12. So if you want to mark the verbs in verse 11 through 23, you're going to see this is what it really means to minister. This is what it means to be a good shepherd, a good leader, a good parent, quite frankly, a good human being, a good friend. The words seeketh, deliver, bring, gather, feed, save, judge, set up, it's these verbs of what the good shepherd does to the flock. These aren't just a nice list of attributes for shepherds back in the olden days. This is a blueprint for my life today. These are the kinds of things I want to do to become more like my Savior. I want to be an under-shepherd that's, that's becoming more and more like him the more I grow. Can I just say there in verse 13, um, this, this is important for me knowing that who Ezekiel is talking to are people, Israel, who have been scattered, right? So imagine what it means to them who have lost the city of Jerusalem, have lost the temple. But again, this hope here that I will bring them out from thy, the people and to gather them in from the countries and I will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places. This then sets up the scene for all of the ways that God is going to bring restoration to scattered Israel. I love that. I love that. And, and you combine that with verse 16, some of these sweet words here. If you think about your efforts to minister, as small as they may seem in your in your mind, that, that text, that phone call, that meal, that go and sit with, whatever it may be, whatever it looks like, look at verse 16, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. I love this idea that it's not our job to fix the problems. It's our job to go and minister to those needs. The good shepherd is the one who ultimately does all these things. Verse 24, I, the Lord, will be their God. I love that, that reminder. We're, we're just supposed to do our, our part and then watch him work his, his mighty miracles. And then verse 25, and I will make with them a covenant of peace. Does this show up anywhere else in the scriptures? I, I didn't search that up before we got in here today, but this covenant of peace seems significant. There's many covenants that are mentioned in scripture, but this one where ultimately you have this covenant of hope and peace, it's like creation happens again, all is good, God is in his heavens, he's on his throne, and it's Sabbath, everything is at peace. You know, one of the things I see from this also is, again, Jeremiah and Ezekiel are talking about some similar things, um, and one of the issues I think both of them are trying to, to do is, how does that covenant work? after the destruction that comes. You know, Jeremiah talks about that in terms of uh, a divorce, mm -hmm. right? And when Jeremiah talks about at least one of the ways he does it is he talks about, I'm going to make a new covenant. Ezekiel, 
um, though, is going to emphasise that there's going to be a renewal of the covenant mm. and it's going to be renewed because the people are going to have a new heart, right? Um, and, it, and, and in different places he's going to talk about this is that the people have to decide that they want a new heart. There's a personal responsibility yeah. as part of this covenant. But then we also get this sense that God will help them get a new heart. Yeah. In fact, if you go over to chapter 36, it, the word new might be the, the, a simple word that you could use to overlay all, over chapter 36. It's that idea, you've been, you've been destroyed, your city has been leveled to the ground, the, the temple burned, everything's in, in shambles, which would leave people with tattered clothing, with bruises and cuts and scrapes and dirty clothing, right? Look at verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. That which was dirty now becomes clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And then verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I don't know how many times in my life I have tried to fix myself and failed. How frustrating that is when I, when I just use force of will alone to, to resolve a problem, and it, it might work for a short period of time, but it ends up failing. I love this idea here of Look closely in verse 26 at where the new heart and the new spirit come from. Do we generate that? Is that something, do I operate on myself and put in a new heart? Or a new heart also will I give you, and the new spirit will I put within you. The renewal, the, the, the newness comes from Christ, not from us. But as Gay was saying, he's not going to come and say, you will love me, Against your will, I'm, I'm going to make you love me. I'm going to put a new heart in you. He doesn't do that. We have to turn to him, come to him and say, I want you to be my God. I want to be thy people. Will you help me? Because I can't, I can't cleanse myself. I can't save myself. I can't, I can't root out of my breast this wicked spirit. But you can. Would you? Okay, and can I just jump in on that too? Because... These people have thought that they could do things in the dark and that they could do what they wanted to do, but God can't help them until they take responsibility for their mistakes and own up and not try and put the blame on other people, right? This is me and mine. And then you've mentioned this here, 27, I will put my spirit within you. I just want to take note that this again is that word ruach, right? So in, in some ways it takes us back to this whirlwind that uh, Ezekiel sees in chapter 1, God will do a whirlwind within us as well in terms of this transformative process as he seeks to make us as he is. And, and what effect does that lead to? Second half of verse 27, this will cause you, once this new spirit is put within you, it will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments yeah. and do them. You will stop trying to, to walk this, this double faced life, uh, and you will do my statutes, you will keep them, you'll walk in the covenant path. I love that. Which now brings us to chapter 37, which is, is loaded with, with imagery and symbolism. And by the way, I, I, I could be wrong here, but I think the only other prophet in the entire Bible who is more visually rich in his imagery, in his writing. Isaiah is close, but I think it's John the Revelator. I think John in the book of Revelation and Ezekiel in the Old Testament, these two, they, they just, they love these, these big visionary symbols. And so, isn't it fascinating that this person who loves to teach and under, make sense of life through symbols, God seems to speak to him through symbols. Yeah. That's his language, that's his understanding. And, and like I said, I think John, the revelator, had that same propensity, and so that's why we get such rich symbolism there. Look at chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. 
Hmm. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. So very dead. Very dead. They've been dead long enough that they're fully, all of the flesh, all of the other elements have decayed and long since dried up. It's just the bones. It's this idea of there is no hope for these bones to come to life on their own. There's, they're dead, sufficiently dead. Can, it also is kind of pulling us back to chapter 6, mm -hmm. where with the destruction that comes with the Babylonians, there are bones everywhere. So it's tying it back to what happened there and the death and destruction. Yeah. And there's, there's a water motif. The Hebrew word for uh, marrow literally means to be um, uh, moisture. So you have water in the bones or moisture in the bones. That means there's life. And it's the water, the moisture of God. God gives the living waters. Which, by the way, as a side note here, as we as we continue forward, in the ancient world, as well as I think in our world today, it, it's it's kind of a sign of of shame to not have a proper burial. And if you're seeing a valley filled with dry bones, what does it mean? That means a whole group of people died shamefully. There's no proper burial. There, there's no covering them in their death where they can return to the dust. In, in, a, in a grave, they're out in the, in the sun being dried up. So verse 3, the Lord, notice how the Lord engages the learner here. He said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? By the way, don't you love it when the Lord asks questions that we would say, mm, that's obvious. He's, he's getting this, this learner of his, Ezekiel, to come along with him, and Ezekiel says, Lord, thou, thou knowest, <laughs> You know the answer to that question. Um, and verse 4 says, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Are you noticing how we're shifting from a vision of, of this valley filled with bones to now a metaphor for what Ezekiel's whole mission as a prophet is or what our prophets today, their mission is, or what ultimately Jesus Christ's role is. You can apply it in all these different settings, this idea of giving life to be restored to that which is dead. So in verse 5, behold, I will cause breath to enter unto you. Guess what the Hebrew word is? It's ruach, right? So it's this breath, spirit, life, very, very rich in, in Ezekiel. Beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing how you have found those uh, thematic connections across that. all these chapters. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, we often miss this because when we see breath and wind, we don't realize there's an underlying uh, Hebrew literary connection. Thank you. Same word in Hebrew gets translated into three different words for us in the Bible. So, verse 7, he prophesied as he was commanded. And as he prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. So that which had dried and separated now comes together, and then I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. No ruach. No ruach. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Ruach. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the... Ruach. Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Over and over again. Over and over. It just keeps this, so you get this, what could be uh, seen as a beautiful metaphor for the ultimate resurrection. But in this context, in Ezekiel's day, it's a beautiful sign of the hope for for Israel and, quite frankly, all nations and all creation, that which has become mortal, that which has experienced death, Christ has the capacity to bring life, and it's going to come line upon line, precept on precept, as he restores that life and gives you a new spirit, a new heart, a new life, a new hope, a new reason to go forward. So, a couple of things. Um, we can read this in terms of the resurrection. Um, in 1933, they discovered a synagogue in, a, in Syria, Dura Europus, and it has these amazing murals um, 
creating the imagery that is being set here. So if you get a chance, go and uh, Google that or something, Dura, Dura Europus, um, and see how, at least in the third century BC, people are understanding what this is happening. But if we look at verses 11 um, through 14, we're going to put it in Ezekiel's context of what he's saying here. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. That's the scattering of Israel. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. That's the important part. It's this gathering that's important that's going to give life to Israel again. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you out of my graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live as a nation and I shall place you in your own land. Okay, I love this because what you're, what you're pointing out here through these verses is the fact that, yes, this is, it's a beautiful symbol for the resurrection, but for Ezekiel and for his day and his people, this is a beautiful metaphor for the gathering of all of the house of Israel, not just the kingdom of Judah, those two tribes in the south, but all of the 12 tribes to be gathered back home and to get new life. And stop, stop and think about what we're engaged in today with the gathering effort. When you, when you bring somebody into the fold of God, as a good shepherd, what you're doing is you're giving them more capacity to use agency, to live. They're, it's as if bones are, are coming together and sinew and, and muscles and skin and breath where they can see things, they can experience things in a spiritual realm as well as in, in, in a mortal realm that they have a new life. They have a new reason to, to wake up every morning and get out of bed and, and move forward on the covenant path. It's this beautiful allusion to the gathering effort. I love it. That is so important to President Nelson. Yes. Today. Yeah. Which actually brings us to a verse that members of the church ha have loved for, for decades. Verse 16, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Keep in mind, it's been, what, 130, 140 years at this time with Ezekiel since we lost the ten tribes, the kingdom of Israel, which was often referred to as Ephraim. They were carried away captive, leaving the two tribes down south called Judah or Zion or Jerusalem, all these different names for that, that tribe down south or that kingdom down south. Notice on one stick we're going to write for Judah and on the other stick, the stick of up north, it's going to be for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So we have that there, there are lots of um, comparisons that we love using in the church today of the, the Bible being the stick of Judah and the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price being the stick of Joseph, and they come together and become one in our hands. That's a beautiful way to liken all scriptures to us in our day, to apply it to our day. I don't know that Ezekiel would have been making that exact comparison in his day if you get it in the flow of this Valley of the Dry Bones and this restoring, gathering the house of Israel. I think he's seeing these you could say it as scrolls, sticks, or you could just see it as two sticks with the names as in the sense of a banner, that they're no longer pitted against each other, but they come together and we reunite Israel, all of the family of Jacob, not so that there's no more split or divide between these two kingdoms that they come together. So you're seeing when you get into scriptures, and especially ancient scriptures, there is layered meaning and layered symbolism, and it's, it's fascinating when you can see things from various perspectives in their cultural context as well as how they've been interpreted by people in the New Testament and by Joseph Smith in, the, in, the, in our latter days and by our current prophets and apostles. 
it's beautiful to say, I don't have to discount all other previous interpretations to accept this application or this particular meaning for that verse. In the scriptures, it's wonderful to be able to have all of them like a banquet at the table and say they're all valid. Some might mean a little more to us, like the scripture analogy today, but it doesn't mean that these other uh, comparisons in the past aren't valid. And can I just jump in there to say, because you might be thinking, okay, I don't have a PhD in ancient Israelite history and things like that, so how am I going to come up with these things? Well, one of the answers is the text itself will say is, will tell you, right? If we don't just take passages and just read them out of their context, but notice Ezekiel is going to give us what he's trying to say in verses 18 and on. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? They were struggling as well. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them even with the stick of Judah and make them one stick, and they are one in mine hand. And the sticks thereof, thou writers, shall be in thine hand and thine eyes. And they shall say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the Gentile nations, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and will bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation um, and in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be a king of them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore. So the scriptures will often tell us what the original intent um, of this is, if we just take the time to read all of it rather than just part of it. So in chapter 43, you'll notice this is the, the return of God's presence into his temple. Now we get in chapter 48 that eventually a river of living water will flow from the temple down into the Dead Sea and heal it and make it like a Garden of Eden. So many of us have thought, well, this seems like it's a recreation of the Jerusalem temple, and yet it's not completely explicit here in chapter 43. It may be that God is speaking more of his created order is his temple, and that he's bringing hope to all of his creation, and that his creation is a temple at peace where his, entire, his presence is everywhere. So, there's, again, two, two different ways you might see this. Maybe it's the new temple at Jerusalem, or maybe God is redeeming and bringing hope to his entire created order. So let's jump into chapter 47. Taylor already alluded to this uh, portion. This had to have been a beautiful moment for Ezekiel to see, uh, starting in verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. So he's sitting there watching as if, what, what is this? I've, he's never seen water coming out from what would be the holy place, that door on the east, and as it comes out by the altar, and it's going to flow to the east. So you'll notice the temple the, the actual sanctuary is here on Mount Moriah with the, the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place, and so you get this water coming out towards the east, because this is north. This is the Kidron Valley. Right over here is the garden called Gethsemane, by the way, just to orient you. So there's water that comes out from the east, and it's going to flow. Well, Mount of Olives is up here, so the water's going to flow down this Kidron Valley into the the Wadi Kidron, which eventually is going to take it into the Dead Sea. That's where all this water is going to end up, right? And if you've ever been to the Dead Sea or down to Qumran or into the Jordan River Valley down there by Jericho, it's pretty dry and desolate, and um, not a lot grows there. So with that understanding, watch what happens with this water. So start in verse 3 as we pick this up. When the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. 
So there's your first measurement. He measured again a thousand, and he brought me through the waters, and they were now to the knees. And then he measured a third time. Now they're to the loins, verse 5. Afterward he measured a thousand, and I was, it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Interesting. So it started as a little trickle, and then it's up to the ankles, and then the knees, and then it gets up to the point where it's, it's such a big river, he can't swim over it. Well, what happens? Verse 8, then said he unto me, these waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go out into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. Brothers and sisters, if anyone ever offers you a, fish, a free fishing excursion to the Dead Sea, don't take them up on it. It's, it's a fraud. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. It is so salty. There's nothing like it on, on planet Earth as far as that size of, of a body of water. There's nothing that can live there. It's so salty. And notice what he just said. The, these waters are going to be healed. Hmm. I wonder if the Lord is sharing yet another analogy, very similar to the Valley of the Dry Bones, but he's teaching using a different symbol that maybe will connect with people differently than the Valley of the Dry Bones did. It's that idea of that which is completely dead. There's nothing there. There's nothing living in it can actually have a hope of a new life, of a new spirit, that it can bring forth in abundance. Look at verse 10. It shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Eneglaim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. So we're taking that which has nothing, no fish in it, and now it's going to bring forth abundantly. I love this idea as you consider the motif carrying us through here of the gathering of the lost and scattered tribes of Israel. Those who don't have life, we bring them in, and you'll notice, where does it all start? In the temple, where the presence of God has returned back in 43, Holy of Holies, it's the glory of God coming out, and it started with a trickle, and it ends up with a river that you can't even swim over, sounds a little bit like you could apply that at one level of symbolism to the restoration of the gospel in these the latter days, that it started so small, it started so simple that it, it, it was just this little um, stream up to your ankles, and the Lord God of Israel is going to continue to do his work, this gathering effort on both sides of the veil, and by the way, this is the veil of the temple right there, separating the holy place from the holy of holies. I love the, the analogy of any effort you and I put into helping anyone get onto the covenant path and make and keep those covenants is helping the Lord to gather Israel on both sides of the veil. I just love this chapter and the newness of life that God promises to bring to that which is dead. So as we come to the close of this study in the book of Ezekiel, uh, you've, you've seen all these patterns and all of these things that are applicable to them back then and at different phases through history, but most importantly in our own lives today. Uh, Gay, what, what would you say is, is kind of the major takeaway for you that would be the most beneficial for, for us in the latter days as we engage with the book of Ezekiel? Um, I, I just want to say that I love the book of Ezekiel, um, and I think uh, it is worth a lifetime of study. But as I'm kind of thinking through this, I, I think about it in terms of my own uh, spiritual journey. Um, in some ways, I feel very much like Ezekiel in chapter one going, I don't understand all of the things of eternity. I have lots of questions that I don't always have answers to. But I do have a sense of the power of God and the power of a covenant relationship with him that enables me to uh, keep going forward in faith, even though I have answers, questions that I, I need answers to. Um, I think about the ways that I sometimes represent 
the people that Ezekiel is speaking to. I have made covenants, and uh, I don't always live up to those covenants in the way that I would like. And Ezekiel reminds me that there are always consequences um, when I don't do so. And God won't always protect me from those consequences. But he gives me hope that in spite of those things, even though my choices sometimes move me away from him, that he will, uh, he will follow me. And he will be there at the times when I am ready to choose to return to him. That he will bless my life in just powerful ways. I don't understand fully the restoration of Israel and all of the, the return of Israel to Jerusalem and things like that. But what I do take from this, that God will always allow me to return to him. But I've got to make the choice. Right? I've got to see that this is in my best interest to align myself with him, his will, his commandments, and his covenant. And for that, I love this book, Ezekiel. That's such a beautiful uh, way to, to summarize this entire book. So wherever you may be in the process between the dry bones and the new life, or between the Dead Sea, wherever you are individually and wherever we are collectively in that process, I don't understand all of this either, but the Lord does, then it's, it's this beautiful idea of letting him be your savior. As we close the, this um, incredible book, look at the very last verse in Ezekiel 48 verse 35, this, the last line. The name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Let it be said, not just of the city of Jerusalem, not just of the house of Israel, not just of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but let it be said of each of us when people tell our story, the Lord is there. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Know that you're loved and spread light and goodness. Thank you.